Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with a weekly review video with Johnny. We'll have a bit of a chat about what has caught Johnny's attention this week here in Spain. So uh, let's go to the video. All right, Johnny, how are you this week? Yeah, good, Stu. Feels like it's been an eventful week in, in Spain this week. What really? What's happened? Well, I think um, we all know last night we're recording this on Thursday, of course. So the debate um, caught the attention of the whole country last night because, of course, this is the elections for Madrid, but um, it will have an impact on the rest of the country, on politics and the rest of Spain as well. So I tuned in live to watch. I didn't expect to be <laughs> tuning in because I tried to steer clear of politics a bit. But did you did you see it live? <laughs> Uh, I started watching it. I I, re I mainly read the press the next day to to check out what what happened and got different points of view. But to be honest, Johnny, I, I can't stand political debates when you've got six people that just argue nonstop. You know, and basically that what well, that's what was happening last night. It was just an attack constantly about different things and ideologies and this and that. It just got boring. Yeah, that's what I saw as well. We mentioned last week the hostile political environment and it was on full display, full display last night. Yeah. Um, it was mainly the, yeah, mainly the far right going at the far left. Um, so Podemos and Vox going at one another. Yep. Um, and people obviously going for Ayuso, um, trying to attack her. I feel like she tried to lay low for most of the debate. Um, she tried to stick to her strengths um, and point out what she feels she's done well in the the Madrid community keeping yeah. the economy open yeah um but yeah I got the impression the left really tried to bring her down with statistics and, and data um throughout <laughs> yeah 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 well I mean let's be honest the data is not good if you go to a statistical point of view a lot of people died in elderly residences last year uh there was a severe problem in Madrid because of the coronavirus pandemic you know the uh, Madrid had fairly bad health statistics compared to other parts of the country and uh you know that argument could be put on the table but again her her defense was that look uh the central government was late to shut the country down uh there were uh rallies going ahead up until the last day before the country was shut down which were organized by the central government so you know it sort of caught, caught people off guard and everybody was caught on the back foot politicians especially and uh that that was her defense or at least that's what i saw uh she was defending yeah it's what i saw as well mm. um i mean everyone has their own angle to come at things i was i was interested by the approach from ciudadanos actually um they preferred rather to just not really get involved and say look look at these this lot fighting it out we we don't want any of that like we'll give you reasonable sensible politics yeah um, yeah and i saw him as well trying to almost reconcile with ayuso and still try and give give his party an opportunity to become part of that um a, co a potential coalition um, that could happen in Madrid if Ayuso doesn't get her majority. Yeah, well, it's the last roll of the dice for that party. I mean, let's be honest, they were they were smashed in the elections in Catalonia and people are predicting that they're going to be smashed in these elections as well. So they put this guy up as the main candidate. They think that he's the, he's the, you know, he's the guy that's going to be able to change people's opinions on this party. But if you talk to people here in Spain, Johnny, the problem with this Citizens Party is they're too wishy-washy. One day they're supporting the Socialist Party, the next day they're supporting the PP. Where are they? You know, so uh, you've you've got to put your you've got to put your 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 allegiance on the line, I suppose, and just and that, and that that's what people want, you know. Well, that's it. Even the Vox candidate said that. She said, uh, of course. Uh, Ciudadanos, you you decided not to go either way on on certain issues. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, yeah. But, but but again, I suppose that's their role as a centre party. I suppose they they think that they can have that flexibility, whereas Vox can't. You know, uh, yeah. Podemos can't have any flexibility because as soon as they do any agreement with a with a right wing party, uh, they they're gone. Or Vox with a left wing party. So I mean, but that's it. But I, I'm surprised to see, and I mentioned this in today's video. I'm surprised to see that we're still talking about, you know, uh, early 20th century ideologies. You know, I mean, are they relevant nowadays? You know, these these uh, communist ideologies and these um, uh, extreme right ideologies. I mean, are they really relevant in a modern political society? I don't know, Johnny. Yeah, the difficulty I find, though, is um, as much as Tiedadanos tries to propose a, a central balanced approach, that politics in general, not just in Spain, but around the world, is becoming more and more polarized. So um, 
it's very difficult for a center party, I think, to attract um, people these days. That's that's the problem that we have, that uh, uh, things are very complicated politically in this country always. There's no, there's no, there's no denying that. And unfortunately, it plays out in, uh, in full view for everybody. Yeah. It is what it is, Johnny. It is what it is. But anyway, so we'll get off yeah. politics. What's next? <laughs> Yeah, so um, there's some changes um, from the Dirección General de Tráfico, which yeah. are coming into play soon. So there's a couple regarding um, driving with your mobile phone. So if you drive with your mobile phone not using it, then you could be risking a 200 euro fine and a three point reduction. And if you are caught using it, you'll get the same fine and it will be a six point reduction. Yeah. There was also um, a penalty uh, that's being introduced for not wearing a mask if you're traveling with people that you don't live with, and that's up to 100 euros. And then some of the the ones that have caught my eyes um, as well are also regarding speed limits. So I think I think it's where the road is level with the pavement um, in urban areas. It's a 20 kilometer speed limit which is being introduced, 30 kilometers on single carriageways, uh, so one lane in either direction, and 50 kilometers on roads with two lanes or more in either direction. And I think the idea around this is to bring a bit more safety, a bit more peace into these urban areas that are maybe um, not not experiencing that right now. It's interesting. I know you've brought up in some of your car vlogs, some of my favorite vlogs, by the way, where you're in the car, um, <laughs> uh, where you're constantly pointing out people who are cutting across lanes or doing crazy stuff at the roundabout. And um, maybe yeah. maybe these um, speed limits will, will see fewer of those cases. Well, I'm going to be honest, Johnny. I, I'm when I when I drive, I'm I'm not the I'm not I'm not you know the type of guy that that can stay in the one lane, especially when I go through roundabouts for some reason. I think it's because of the the, the design of the roundabouts. So I think I mentioned this once. They sort of uh, you, the the temptation's always there just to cut straight across, and that's what a lot of people do. Mm. Um, the prop the problem that I find here, and I'm, I'm sure this is a problem around Spain is general, is that in, in general is that the, the crosswalks are sometimes really badly designed. So sometimes there's no uh, space between the, the crosswalk and the car that's parked there, so you can't see kids sometimes when they're crossing. Um, sometimes you've got a bus uh, stop right next to one of these things as well, so, so the, the visibility is really lacking, and at night a lot of them are not lit up. And there are some streets where people just don't even stop. So basically, pedestrians put their lives into their own hands crossing the road, you know. Yeah, well, I've seen examples of all three of the, <laughs> the cases you just mentioned, um, yeah. particularly one of the one of the streets on the other side um, where I used to live of Madrid. Um, it's I think it's two lanes in both directions and there's uh, a pedestrian crossing with cars right in front. And I remember one time just crossing and some guy, it's almost like he deliberately sped up while I was going across the crossing. <laughs> and yeah. I was just thinking like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> seriously? And, then, and, then, and then there's another thing that really annoys me here is that sometimes you're waiting to cross the road and the car, the car doesn't stop and they give you a little wave as if to say, oh, sorry, sorry, mate, you know, I, I, I wasn't oh, able yeah. to stop. So, so, sorry, I mate. That and, and that's also <laughs> common when you're driving as well, Johnny, when people don't uh, respect the roundabouts and you're in the middle of the roundabout and you've got to put the brakes on because the car, you know, to the right hasn't stopped and, and you get this little wave, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah, rubbish you didn't see me, mate. <laughs> rubbish you didn't yeah. see me. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I, frustrations yeah. of driving in Spain. Yeah, and I definitely feel the frustration as a pedestrian as well. Um, I feel like sometimes if I don't step out into the road, the car won't stop. So. Yeah. Well, sometimes, very much well, sometimes you have to take the matter into your own hands. Exactly right. Force the force That's the it. car to yeah. stop. And but um, as we know, if uh, if you get hit by a car, you you're going to be the one that comes off uh, the worst. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And uh, the mobile one, I think there's always been points for getting caught with your driving with your mobile, but they're starting to crack down on it. And the mask one there, obviously. I mean, but. How do you police that? What do they stop every car with four people in and and ask people for identification to see that they live in the same house? I mean, how do you how do you police it? Yeah, I guess the only way to stop it is at like puntos de control. Yeah. Really, is like if like you're being controlled. Check. That's yeah, exactly a random check or someone who's leaving. Uh, one autonomous community to go to another who maybe gets stopped by a policeman and has passengers in the car. That's maybe 
that's maybe one way to check it. Yeah, otherwise, I think within within a city or within a particular community, unless you're near the border, then I think it's it's difficult to police, like you said. Yeah, probably, probably. That's it. But, uh, yeah. but again, uh, revenue raising, who knows? Yeah, could be. That's it. And the objective of re- of lowering those speed limits, as I said today, was to was the, uh, the 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 head of the traffic department was on the television the other day, and he said he said, look, if somebody gets hit doing thirty, they might not die, but if they get hit doing fifty, they'll, they'll, there's a very high chance that they will die. But this guy, he was the he was the head of the traffic department back with the last socialist government back in two thousand and eight, and they also reduced the speeds back then as well for for a couple of months, and then they put them back up again. It must cost a lot of money to change the signs every time. All right. So what else have we yeah. got, Johnny? Yeah. So some news that came out just today that caught my eye is that. Um, BBVA Bank uh, are closing uh, 530 of their offices, um, so that represents 3,000 jobs and 13% of their staff. Um, and you pointed out as well um, in that same article, Kaisha Bank are also closing um, offices and um, seeing off staff, so they're closing 1,500 offices, um, and that represents 8,000 jobs. So um, sad news for people working in, in those banks. Um, Unfortunately, well, it depends what type of agreement they come to. Maybe, maybe a lot of people will get pre- juicy pre-retirements like they've done for a long time. You know, if you go to any golf course around Spain, it's full of fifty-six-year-old pre-retired former bank workers that are enjoying, are living the life. You know, and uh, because banks have put a lot of money into this in the past, I don't know whether that's going to happen here as well. It could happen. Um, but uh, huge layoffs. I think something like a hundred thousand people in the last ten years have been have lost their jobs in the banking sector because it's 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 a business that that is it is you know it's suffering. It really is suffering. Yeah, um, I mean BBVA. They've said it's impossible to compete with the the current interest rates. Um, the digital transformation. I think they're a bit behind as well. Some of these new fintech banks that are coming in, they're they're really changing the way um, we do banking. I reviewed one of them on my channel recently. Yeah. Um, and if you're like a young person, then they're primarily going to target young people with their services. And I think yeah, the traditional banks, they're struggling to get new customers. Um, it's very difficult for them to do business, especially in the the, the economic climate we're in right now. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I saw. So they really I saw, need to catch on a bit. Yeah, I saw a TED talk a few years ago, and it was somebody talking about this. And they said the big, the big revolution in banking is not going to come from a traditional bank. It's going to come from a company that puts its services on top of the existing system. You know, That's so similar it, yeah. to what other, uh, like a tech company, for example. And That's you mentioned it, yeah. fintechs, for you know. Yeah, I mean the one that I reviewed. It's called it's called Vivid, and you get there's a, there's a pretty. Pretty interesting cashback program. You can get up to ten percent back in the likes of Lidl, in Aldi, in supermarkets, and you know that that cashback it comes in the form of shares and it's automatically invested for you. Um, so stuff that like people like me and the younger generation, where where we would look traditionally to a traditional bank with with a poor interest savings account, like new solutions are popping up, and I think the the traditional banks are, are relying on their historical competencies and performance to try and stay in the game yeah um and i think now is it's probably been a wake-up call um for some of these bigger banks that they need to um catch up and get with the times a bit because i know it's happened in france as well france has had a few traditional banks that have realized they have to change their operating model as well to, to stay to stay relevant yeah yeah well the big the big one here is that that merger that you mentioned there between Caixa bank and bank i mean bank here was caja madrid i mean we're talking you know a a, a a very traditional bank here in the in the madrid community or the city of madrid goes back a long way a long history um basically it was a uh, they call it a merger but basically it was Caixa bank taking it over you know and and uh, the brand's disappearing, and uh, yeah, Caixa Bank is uh, going to dominate the banking landscape around the country, along with two or three other banks, the ones that you mentioned there, Santander and BBVA, I think you said, yeah. Not sure if you've been by Plaza de Castilla recently, Stu, but those those famous bank towers now. Yeah, what are they, the they gone, have they? They've, they're still there, but they have the Caixa Bank logo on now. Oh, well, of course, yeah, because that's, <laughs> yeah. that's that's all part. Well, that's it. That's gone from Caja Madrid. That's right in in the in in the in the old in the, in the old days, and then it went to Bank here, and now now of course Caixa Bank. A lot of people in Madrid not happy about that as well. They don't want their money 
being controlled by a Catalan bank, but we don't. I don't want to go too much into the politics side of it. But I know a lot of people that said they're just going to shut their their accounts directly rather than rather than go into the Keisha organization. Yeah, I did. I do think though, in 2017, following um, what happened in Barcelona, Caixa Bank did actually change its uh, headquarters. I think they moved from Barcelona into Valencia, actually. So, obviously, they still got their Catalan roots, but they've. Um, I think based on yeah the situation at the well, time, they, they yeah, wanted the, to I think, avert some of that risk. Yeah, I think they just changed their tax address, didn't they, to move it out? I, I don't think they actually. I, I think they still recognise themselves as a Catalan company. I think. Mm. Yeah. I think, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, that, that's just people that I speak to. But then again, people that I speak to are quite radical. Madrileños, no, very, they, they don't even drink cava because it comes from Catalonia, you know. So Oof, they, would, yeah. they would prefer to drink a, uh, a a bottle of sparkling wine from Extremadura rather than uh, rather than open a bottle of cava. But uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's how that's how uh, deep some of these um some of these. Uh, conflicts can run that people have yeah uh, yeah it'll be interesting to see but you know as you said huge amounts of people laid off in this sector and where are they going to go into fintechs probably some of them yeah i mean some of these fintechs very innovative people who've got years of experience in banking um could be really helpful um in driving these fintechs forward um yeah but yeah what i think is clear from this in any case is that banking is banking is changing as we know it Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the big fintechs, it's called Fintonic. Have you heard of it? Yes, yes, I, I do use the app. Um, oh, okay. Really useful, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for budgeting and tracking your, your, your spending and, and savings. Yeah, um, well, they, yeah. They, they were former um, big bank employees. I think they were working for Benesto Bank or Santander Bank, and they, they uh, took an offer to get out and set up their own fintech, and I think um, they've done very well. Yeah, they've um, they've significantly expanded their range of services as well. They started off, I think, just budgeting and then consolidated um, banking, like you, so you could see all of your accounts at once, your balance. Then they've launched their own virtual card and, and banking services. So mm. yeah, I think yeah, the range of services they're offering is really growing, and they yeah, they definitely have potential in Spain. Good, good, all right. And the last thing, Johnny, the 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 you're bringing the topic back to football as you normally do, Super <laughs> League. <laughs> yeah, well, the or the end of the Super League, so oh, well. everyone has has left yeah. uh, Real Madrid and Barca. Um, I think mainly because of the threat from UEFA um, in terms of Champions League sanctions, and then from the British government as well, who've really pushed to try and to stop this this Super League phenom to take off. Why is that? Uh, why did Why well, did Boris think- Johnson get involved? Why Boris gets involved? <laughs> I'm, I'm not too sure, but a lot of people in um, in the UK football landscape, the likes of Gary Neville, um, other Manchester United footballers um, have been against it. Even Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager, they've been against it because I think they just think it takes the competitive spirit out of football. Because yeah. one of the rules that was coming up with the Super League is that those founding clubs, um, so the teams that were originally going to be in it, were immune to elimination. Um, and yeah, it kind of... It's good to see like competitive high level football amongst the big clubs, but yeah, dominated by that, I can somewhat see like it's a bit frustrating. Yeah. In any case, the the Madrid president Florentino Perez, uh, he said it was necessary to to save football. Um, in his quotes, following a, a difficult year where yeah. football has been um, impacted by the pandemic, fans not being able to attend yeah. stadiums yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. clubs clubs needing money essentially. Yeah. Well, his argument the other day was that young people the the younger generations Johnny probably yourself included in this are not following football like previous generations for whatever reason maybe it's the you know the games are too long maybe it's they've got other things to you know distracting them the internet for example and things like that you know social media networks and a lot of football clubs are complaining that they're not getting that youth support that they that they have uh, historically got and and that was one of his main arguments. But the counter argument could be that a club like Real Madrid basically broke the transfer market a few years ago by paying way over the top prices, in my opinion, for some of those high level players. They, I don't know whether you remember, but they had a team called the Galacticos back there, where I think they had Beckham and oh, yeah. they had they had like this uh, ridiculous, ridiculously expensive team and. They they haven't been able to do it. Ronaldo, they paid a huge amount of money for him, you know, and um, 
I, I mean, in Spain, nobody can compete with those clubs. I mean, uh, they win the league basically every year, either either Barcelona or Real Madrid. So they've already broken the Spanish league, basically. Yeah, well, it's a good point you mentioned about people not following football as much this year. Definitely during the pandemic times, um, I've kind of lost a bit of an interest. Not that I followed it a lot before, but yeah, even less so now would I try and stay in touch with football or sports in general for that matter, just because it's not the same experience as it was before. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a good point you raise about Los Galacticos. Yeah. The Galacticos, yeah. Um, they have a, a documentary on, on Netflix or Amazon about them as well, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, um, I, I can't remember yeah. exactly play. I can't remember ex- every exact player in that team, but I'm, I'm fairly sure it was Beckham and maybe even Fidan was playing back then as well. Fidan and was playing. Maybe Figo you're, was still playing. Um, yeah, you had but, Figo, you had they, they Hierro, had a, Casillas. Yeah, they had a spectacular team. Yeah, yeah, really good team. But yeah, I think yeah, since that time. A lot of people that I've spoken to here and in France when I lived there, they actually watch the Premier League probably more than they watch their native leagues. Maybe Spain, they watch La Liga a bit more. But it's it's somewhat predictable. The Premier League can change year on year um, in terms of the good clubs. But yeah. in the likes of Spain, you know, you look who's won the title over the past 20 years. It's either Real, Barcelona, Atletico. Valencia's in there once or twice. Well, Atletico's probably won maybe once or twice in those last 20 years, yeah. I wouldn't say yeah. that anymore, no. Exactly, yeah. But you look at it, it's it's basically Barcelona and Real that have won oh, La Liga. Of course, yeah. yeah. But they've, yeah. Got, they've got huge budgets and the, 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 the Spanish market is in their favour with the television rights. I mean, they get they get a lot more money than other clubs. Ba- basically, if you follow one of the one of the second tier or third tier clubs, you've got no chance ever. I, I don't think of winning the league. It's just it just it just won't happen. And and mm. a lot of people here say, oh, a couple of years ago in the Premier League, uh, you know, one of, I think that uh, one of those outsiders won. You know, I can't remember which team it was at the moment, but. Um, Leicester City, remember? I think, probably. Was it Leicester? Leicester okay. City. So, so, but yeah. here, that that's. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I, you know, I can't see it happening just because of the huge budgets. That's it. Yeah, and if you think in France, it's a similar, probably if not even more, disproportionate situation. Like Paris Saint Germain have won the league for I don't know how many years in a row. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Yep. Um, they have huge budgets compared to the rest of the French clubs, and yep. yeah. When you haven't got the same money or following to to operate with, and it, it does get not challenging easy. when That's you, it. you come That's to it. the clubs, yeah, not easy. All right, good, Johnny. We'll leave yeah. it there. We'll start to wrap yeah, we'll up. Wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, good speaking to you again, and uh, we'll be in contact for next week. Likewise, let's speak next week too. All right, have a good one. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. So there we go. That was the weekly review. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the situation out as you normally do. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't. See you in the next one. Hasta luego.